took care to please make it live so that the other participants also can view us. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So on behalf of Indian Pharmacological Society West Bengal chapter, Association of Clinical Pharmacologists in India, and also the Indian Society of Clinical Research East Zone, I welcome you all in this webinar on clinical research. So we are really delighted to have with us Professor Vikash Medhi, who needs no introduction, uh, he is now the chief editor of Indian Journal of Pharmacology. So we are really privileged to have you, sir. So uh, I am requesting you to please have some introductory comment so that we can proceed for the... Sorry for the interruption. So may I request you, sir, to please uh, give some introductory comment to us. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I look like to congratulate you for these academic activities from uh, West Bengal uh, Indian Pharmacology Society chapters. So as you can see that uh, we have the largest, uh, you know, uh, society uh, in India, IPS. And at the same time, I also look after IUFAR activities that have been assigned uh, since uh, this year to 2026. So uh, I just wanted to highlight that uh, from IPS, uh, the main uh, branch, so we have been doing uh, several uh, skill development activities because if you look at, uh, we have an infrastructure of 600 medical colleges like uh, 22 AIMS, uh, other PJ like Institute. So we have approximately 600 uh, you know, MD students or the uh, rest of them are DM students. So several facilities like uh, they have started a DM facility also. So uh, um, uh, since uh, I'd like to congratulate you because you have started, but otherwise uh, those who wanted to go in detail, like we have a publication development skill program along with systematic review and meta-analysis, this we have been doing. So we maybe completed around 55 different program along with GLP, GCP. Uh, then uh, recently we launched a program called Advanced Course of uh, Clinical Pharmacology. So we started from the rural college in UP, uh, that's in Kannus, and which is around 250 kilometers from Lucknow. Then uh, we had a meeting with government of India, INSA. They wanted to you know, spread to the South countries. So that's how we went to Nepal. So I recently been to uh, Sri Lanka. So we'll be spreading to Bhutan, Bangladesh. So we are starting the program in CS countries also, CS countries and Asian countries from uh, next month onward. So IPS is going global, and then we'll go to Middle East also. So I just request all the resident, those who are interested, so they can write to me. So as we, we can conduct it, and obviously that we'll be having uh, at least once in a month or twice in a month a program, so that uh, people will be more oriented to what are the updates are going on in terms of experimental research, in terms of clinical pharmacology, analytical. So we'll be dealing that topic with uh, you know, renowned expert from India as well as from abroad form. So I, uh, as a part of the IUFR, so I also uh, going to create the facilities for all the PG students in India, including SART countries and other globally. So I'll not go in more detail because you have a time constant, but uh, I thank you everyone for, uh, you know, IPS uh, for doing a great activities for the PG student, definitely. Uh, you know, whatever new student it comes, when you go for the evaluation, you want, okay, they're the skilled people and they can contribute in yourself for India and globally also. Thank you very much. Uh, so go to also join. So good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have an IND meeting. So in between, I have to leave uh, because today they call for an urgent IND meeting. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for giving us your valuable time. Now, may I now request uh, Dr. Shubhra Jyoti Bhomik, who is the Chair of Indian Society of Clinical Research, East Zone, to have some introductory comment. Thank you, Shambhu, and good afternoon to one and all. It gives me immense pleasure that the West Bengal IPS, along with the Indian Society for Clinical Research, East Zone, is organizing this wonderful event. I see Professor Mehdi here. Professor Mehdi, thank you, sir, for taking out time 
from your busy schedule and giving us the inaugural comment. IPS is doing commendable work under your leadership and we really hope that we will give get your support. West Bengal IPS is going to get your support in doing further activities. At IACR, we are committed for their capacity building across the region in East. And I thank Dr. Shambo for taking this uh, very important initiative. I, uh, in the, uh, today, our chairs are my very dear friend, Professor Melvin George, all the way from Chennai. So nice to see you, Melvin. And uh, also welcome Professor Patanayak from PGI Chandigarh. So welcome, Madam, for this particular meeting. And I also would uh, congratulate Dr. Shomal Shane, who is going to speak on a very difficult topic. I found it very difficult when I was doing my post-graduation. So systematic review is something which is a very important topic. So thank, thanks for picking up this important topic. And uh, I, we will say that this is going to be a continued affair. This is not going to be a one-off affair. ICR has been organizing a lot of activities just for information in the month, month of March, 2023. ICR in East will organize an CRC conference, Clinical Research Coordinator Conference, where we invite all the participants to participate in Kolkata, and we look forward to your support. So thank you once again, uh, one and all, for your participation today. Thank you. Thank you, Shubrada, for your kind comment. So now may I request, because today also we are really uh, privileged to have the association of our Association of Clinical Pharmacologists in India. Uh, we have General Secretary of SCPI, Professor Melvin George. So uh, he is the chairperson of this particular event or two. But from the organizational point of view, may I request, sir, to have some comment. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shambhu. It, uh, it's indeed a great initiative that uh, we are uh, taking to do this uh, a webinar on systematic reviews and meta-analysis. This is certainly the need of the R uh, because we often see uh, a lot of uh, trials that are being published uh, all across the world, especially in certain regions, especially in China and many of the uh, Middle East countries of late. And uh, some of, sometimes we see that uh, the trial results are leading us nowhere. Uh, they are not able to conclusively uh, bringing out a picture as to whether the particular intervention is working or not. So having a tool like meta-analysis to pull up all these results and uh, giving a wholesome picture as to how exactly the intervention is behaving. If we are uh, training ourselves and equipping ourselves to do a thorough systematic review and meta-analysis, it will certainly boost the kind of... Uh, evidence that we are generating as with respect to the different interventions, trials that are coming up. So I want to congratulate Dr. Shambhu and team for uh, doing this endeavor. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be a chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Professor George. And thank you uh, for SCPI for giving us this opportunity to propose this meeting along with IPS West Bengal and ISCR East June. So now it is, uh, we have to start the academic session. And we are really fortunate to have two eminent chairs with us, Professor Smita Patanayak, who is a very noted clinical pharmacologist in this country, is the professor at the Department of Clinical Pharmacology at PGI MER Chandigarh. So welcome you, madam. And also we have Professor Melvin George, who is a reputed clinical pharmacologist too in this country. And Sir is now the head at the Department of Clinical Pharmacology at SRM Medical College, Chennai. So welcome you, sir. Now over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shambhu. Thank you for uh, inviting me and, uh, and asking me to chair. And it's definitely a pleasure to uh, be at the West Bengal Society. And... Uh, uh, so today's topic is uh, uh, introduction to systematic review and meta-analysis. So as we discussed in the, uh, Dr. Uh, Melvin has already introduced the topic and um, it's, uh, I always keep telling that this is one kind of research where, where with internet accessibility, you can do it anywhere from anywhere, it's, it's literally from anywhere you can do it. You may be sitting on an island or sitting in Himachal Pradesh or sitting in uh, uh, Andaman and Nicobar. You have an access to the internet 
and the resources can be pulled. So that's my take on it. And uh, finally, uh, uh, Dr. Melvin mentioned that there are so many clinical trials coming up and there are many groups who are on a lookout for the topic on which you are going to conduct the systematic review. So basically, the awareness of the what is going on in the current uh, uh, literature is something that is very important. And I feel uh, that our students are definitely much more uh, uh, capable than any other part of the world because of the sheer uh, knowledge and the uh, good command on the English language. Uh, now, secondly, uh, the, sec uh, the most important uh, part here is some of us uh, are lacking in the technical knowledge to conduct a systematic review. And uh, with the uh, internet, even many, many things are available uh, online to uh, as a teaching module, as a learning module. And honestly, I'm also still learning, though I did a couple of them and then lost interest in between uh, in the interest of time when you have certain other things to catch up with. So it's definitely one thing one can uh, pick up and uh, uh, build your own uh, skills in that area. So over to you, Dr. Melvin. And I... I uh, Ask, I, I invite you to introduce the speaker for today. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Smitha. So uh, the speaker for this afternoon is uh, Dr. Somalia Sen. Dr. Somalia uh, completed his uh, DM from the School of Tropical Medicine, Calcutta, uh, uh, in DM Clinical Pharmacology, MD Pharmacology from CMC Vellore, and MBBS from Burdwan Medical College in West Bengal. And uh, Dr. Sumalyasen is a very active clinical pharmacologist who has uh, participated in several clinical trials, uh, in particularly in the area of vaccines, HIV, and even device trials. He has several publications to his credit and is also uh, has a patent in his name. So uh, we thank Dr. Sumalya for uh, graciously accepting this uh, 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 decision to uh, do this talk this afternoon on systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So over to you, Dr. Sen. Uh, am I audible, uh, Melvin, sir? Yes, you are audible, Dr. Sen. Please go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, you can share your you. screen. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Smita, Madam, uh, Dr. Subrajiti Bhomita, uh, as well as definitely the organizers and especially the key person for communication, uh, Dr. Shambo. Uh, I'd also request uh, not being a chairperson, I just saw that Professor Tripathi sir also joined. So being a noted clinical pharmacologist in India, if also he wants to say some words, if you allow, sir. Good afternoon, sir. My regards to you. Good afternoon, Tripathi sir. If you, uh, are you there, sir? So you can open your video, sir. So no, also, I'm, I'm sir, there, but I'm having my CPI. So yes, welcome you, sir. Good yeah, I, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be listening. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, let me let me listen to the presentation. Uh, I'm right now actually having my lunch and at the same time trying to listen to the okay, presentation. Sir. Okay, so maybe at the end, end, maybe at the end, I can have a few comments. Okay, okay. and thank you all for taking this initiative. It's extremely needed and. Uh, Keep it going. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Melvin. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Sumalla and our our uh, chairperson from PGI, Dr. Uh, Dr. Smitha. 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 <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. Extremely, extremely sorry. <laughs> Dr. No Smita. worries, sir. We will always remain uh, your no, student Dr. only. Smita, I remember that uh, uh, in Kolkata, when I uh, thought of getting our people acquainted with the uh, methods for systematic review meta-analysis, you were one of the pioneers. You, you responded to our call and you had come and you had tried to actually, uh, actually uh, sensitize some of our students to systematic review meta-analysis methods. So we are really grateful for that to you. And uh, it will be a good session today. Let's look forward. 
let's hear Dr. Shumalla Sen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, we'll proceed to the session directly. Uh, that is a systematic review, meta-analysis, and its importance in decision-making in clinical practice. Uh, so there are, we can see that lots of parts. That means one is to see a systematic review and interpret it. And next is that how a clinician can apply the knowledge of his or her into his or her clinical practice. So the outline of presentation would be like that, that evidence-based medicine along with the next will be systematic review, meta-analysis, why and when, how to do and interpret a systematic review uh, or meta-analysis that will be very nutshell and place of SRMA in evidence-based medicine and the way forward. Because each session uh, might be for uh, taken for a uh, duration of one or two hours. So uh, as a whole, as we are discussing today, we will be very brief in each content. So what is evidence-based medicine? Um, all of us are aware about this terminology. And this is a conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of the current best ev uh, evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And we know that there is a knowledge experience skill and the patient values and preferences. And with that, the best available evidence that has been made and that is applied in clinical decisions. Because all the data that we are generating and sometimes secondary data that we are including in these studies, uh, those data has to be transferred clinically so that that helps in the patient care. <clears throat> Evidence-based medicine and Cochrane collaboration, that's a very important uh, thing to know. Uh, again, we must be aware uh, about the Cochrane collaboration and uh, evidence-based medicine, what is it and what it is not. It's about integrating the individual clinical expertise and the best external evidence as mentioned uh, in this BMJ article. And the uh, father of evidence is made, uh, uh, he actually uh, started this uh, venture. And we know that the Cochrane collaboration and how the, uh, the systematic review and meta-analysis are uh, published there and how they represent the things. So uh, if we look into the Cochrane Collaboration logo, there itself the forest plot, that's uh, uh, one representation of uh, meta-analysis uh, given. Uh, just uh, we can see in the left-sided picture that some horizontal lines, uh, diamond-shaped thing is there. And these things are actually a small summary of a forest plot. And from one of the first, this has been depicted from a first uh, systematic review ever published uh, that was in 1991, which showed that giving steroids to mothers whose babies were due to born pre prematurely reduced the complications of prematurity. So again, we are aware about this first one, that is this evidence pyramid that on the top we can see this systematic review meta-analysis followed by the, in the downstream, the randomized control trials and further on. Uh, now, uh, there is other uh, uh, discussions also going on, not to consider systematic review and meta-analysis uh, to be on the top, rather it can be considered, this, these all are discussions nowadays going on, that systematic review and meta-analysis can be considered as a magnifying glass so that it's, it can analyze each and every uh, studies of uh, either that may be randomized trial, that may be case control or the cohort studies, and uh, that uh, knowledge is apply applied. And after that, that can be a summary made, uh, which is either maybe systematic review and if the uh, statistics also incorporated as a meta-analysis. Recent BMJ article actually, uh, a recent BMJ article actually give this concept of this magnifying glass uh, to be considered as a systematic review and meta-analysis. So uh, these reflections on this evidence pyramid actually based on this grade, that is grading of recommendation, assessment, development, and evaluation working group who developed this framework and certainty in the evidence was based on numerous factors. And the study design alone is insufficient as a surrogate for risk of bias. Hence, these wavy lines that we have seen uh, were inserted. And the credibility of the process of a systematic review is evaluated first. If the systematic review is deemed sufficiently credible, 
then the certainty in evidence based on the grade approach is evaluated. Uh, based upon this grade, uh, there are different types of levels or types of evidence that has been uh, uh, subdivided. And though the principle, principally it may be same, but there are in different countries, different uh, systems sometimes used like United States, Primitive Task Force, Oxford, CB, uh, but the concept is same. Uh, according to this uh, CEM, we can one A uh, belong systematic review in RCT one uh, two A systematic review homogeneity to be that stands for the cohort study including low quality or cities two C stands for outcome research or class studies. Uh, a stands for the systematic review of case control studies and four stands for case series five stands for expert opinion without explicit clinical critical appraisal or based on physiology bench research or first principles uh, though in this platform uh, other clinicians from uh, doctors from other uh, uh, streams are also present uh, medical pharmacologists and clinical pharmacologists have a very crucial role uh, in this evidence-based medicine. Actually, it's a teamwork and this medical pharmacologist in India, they do have in different parts of activity like regulatory, academia, industry, clinical practice, research, and evidence-based medicine also had different parts. So it can be incorporated by the, uh, different parts uh, by the medical pharmacologist. Uh, as Dr. Bimkas Medishar was talking about, and he was taking uh, taking the call out, very interesting things. Uh, Ayufar also um, said that the scopes of the medical pharmacologist uh, in different manners. And here we can see that what are the different options available and uh, what are the different arenas they can uh, pick off. Now, what is evidence synthesis? Evidence synthesis is the very crucial step in before doing uh, this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. According to Royal Society, evidence synthesis refers to the process of bringing together information from a range of sources and disciplines to inform debates and decisions on specific issues. They generally include a methodological comprehensive literature synthesis focused on a well-formulated research question. So that's, that's the uh, key part that uh, one should have a hypothesis uh, before conducting a, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, whenever a systematic review comes, another uh, very common uh, terminology comes, that is narrative review. And there are certain differences between systematic review and narrative review. Uh, all of us might be knowing, but uh, uh, for this today's session, we will just summarize the differences. Uh, we will uh, see that the research question is very much specific for systematic review. And for narrative review, is really it is broad. The methodology is very much clearly defined for systematic review, uh, but not this is not applicable for narrative review. Search strategy, again, it should be clearly defined. The selection of the studies, that should be clearly defined. Assessment of the study quality, that should be objectively performed. Analysis of studies at multiple levels, again, that should be clearly described. And interpretation of the results, that should be objective and that should be reproducible. Uh, all these points are actually keeping this systematic review and meta-analysis on the top of the uh, evidence pyramid that we have seen. Systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, systematic review that can be uh, a qualitative method, or again, that can be a quantitative uh, using certain statistical tools, uh, that can be a Bayesian approach, or that can be a frequentist approach. Uh, these approaches, uh, maybe a separate session, Dr. Shambo can arrange uh, based on statistical tools, but just for our reference, uh, we should know that the Bayesian models actually incorporate the prior knowledge into the analysis updating the hypothesis probabilities as more data becomes available. And the frequentist approach, they assigns probability to the data, not to the hypothesis. So this is the difference. That means the Bayesian approach assigns probability to the hypothesis and the frequentist approach assigns probability to the data, not to the hypothesis. Uh, what is the significance of a systematic review? Systematic review actually minimize the bias. 
So um, as Dr. Uh, Professor Medisar was talking at the very beginning, that there are lots of trials uh, uh, or studies uh, um, uh, in front of us if we look into a certain topic into the internet, but which topic and which data or which study we should follow if a clinician wants to follow a study for his patient, in that case, which one he should follow. So there should be minimal minimum bias. So that uh, that's why the systematic review came and systematic review minimized this bias. A systematic review is a more scientific method of summarizing the literature because specific protocols are used to determine which studies will be included in the review. Clinicians and researchers like to rely on systematic reviews in order to make an informed decision. So <clears throat> why are these systematic reviews necessary? Because the number of published papers make it impossible for a clinician or researcher to remain up to date on the various topics. So studies, reports contradict, sometimes contradict, and especially those with small sample size, or sometimes these retrospective designs. Now, uh, when uh, one should do uh, SRMA, uh, so uh, there should be specific objectives. Uh, we know this uh, from our uh, previous knowledge that this P-code should be there. Uh, that means the patient intervention, comparison, outcome, and sometimes time. And this, uh, uh, following the uh, following that, there should be conflicting or unclear evidence across the voluminous literature, and need to summarize the scientific evidence objectively in a structured way. So, uh, when doing a, a systematic review and or meta analysis, in that time, uh, a very important crucial step is to write down a protocol. And after writing up the protocol, finalization of the protocol, uh, it should be registered. Uh, uh, this registration is uh, must, and the key requirements is that specific objectives and outcomes uh, should be there search strategies that is studies and parameters to include data synthesis, detailed plan of the statistical analysis. Uh, Prospero is uh, one for this uh, protocol registration. This has been made mandatory for good number of journals because while publishing, they ask for these details that uh, these registration details and all other things because uh, sometimes all of us aware that there are certain uh, poor quality journals also available uh, those data may not be reliable uh, despite being a systematic review. So to cut short that bias, uh, we can have uh, this registration, that means this protocol registration mandatory. Now, the, these steps that has been mentioned in this uh, Prospero, they have made this step one, two, three, four, five, like that in small steps. And in here, this includes exclusion criteria is very important followed by this ensure that the review protocol is in uh, its near final form and that no major changes are anticipated at this stage and next search prospero to ensure that your review has not already been registered by another member of your team next is search prospero to ensure that you are not unnecessarily duplicating a review that is being done by another team or has been registered previously start registering your review and there there are two options one is register a systematic review of health research studies that is study participants of people and another is study subjects or animals so all these steps are actually very important because we know that if there is duplicity of the same studies in that case the, the results might be again confusing the clinicians next is that at the time of writing protocol and at the time of registration of the protocol, if there is a long gap, maybe one, one year, in that one year period, maybe other persons have already registered on the same topic. So in, in that case, you may not be eligible or applicable to do the same study. So that's why uh, finalization and followed by or near finalization and followed by registration into this Prospero is very important. Now, developing this protocol is, is protocol is a very essential component of this systematic review. Uh, as we know that protocol is like a roadmap. And here the, in this systematic review, uh, the protocol uh, that is the roadmap, it should have, uh, we should have all the things, probabilities inside our mind during writing up this uh, uh, protocol. And it helps to ensure the careful a priori planning of whole process in terms of consistency, transparency, 
transparency and integrity. And journals often require a protocol registration number before publishing this systematic review. Yeah, yeah, this protocol or research question can be a very broad question like effect of metformin on exercise capacity or meta-analysis, or it can be a very specific like efficacy and safety of program cell death uh, or cell death ligand, inhibit, uh, ligand one inhibitor in advanced urothelial malignancy, a systematic review and meta-analysis. And this uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria in the protocol, it should be very much precise. That means what are the kind of studies to be selected? Is it only RCTs? Any specific comparator, duration of treatment, specific outcomes, all those should be mentioned very much clearly according to uh, your study in this protocol. And uh, whether it should be only RCT, uh, focusing on this question, we will move to the next slide. That means uh, this, we can see this uh, PLOS publication that Cosmos E, that guidance uh, on conducting systematic review and meta-analysis of observational studies of etiology. So uh, for observational studies also for a specific type, uh, this category that is systematic review and meta-analysis can be done. And there are certain uh, methodology statistical procedure for that. Now, the literature search, again, uh, we should not say that this is the key step in uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. Actually, all the steps are key steps in systematic review and meta-analysis. And all the steps, it's uh, merely impossible to do by a single person. There should be a dedicated team for doing this systematic review or different types of expert in different states. So the literature search uh, that should be based on key data that is that should be including different languages. It's not that only English and uh, key registries, uh, major conference proceedings, uh, contacting sometimes individual authors and uh, very key points are search terms, combinations and search strings, which should be reproducible. So uh, all these are very important during doing this literature search. During this literature search, we should be very much methodological and we have to be very uh, uh, planned very first and list of the popular databases to search as we have seen uh, in the previous uh, uh, slide that PubMed, Medline, Embase, Cochrane Review, uh, Scopus all should be there. Uh, uh, otherwise, there will be database bias. Other strategies also uh, one may adopt that, that to include the gray literature sometimes, like trial registries, abstract from the meetings, hand search. Sometimes it's that uh, you, you are seeing that some data can be available from a particular author, but you are not getting the data. So one need to write down an email or a formal communication to the author to get the data uh, that you are required. Uh, after that, you they might respond, they might not respond. Uh, that's a different scenario. But if you are getting the response, you should include that part also. Now, study selection based on the <coughs> inclusion and exclusion criteria. This is a very important uh, thing is that it's a teamwork. The uh, screening the abstracts is very important. After that, retrieve the full text where necessary and then resolve the disagreements. So as we can see in the lower, uh, lower flow diagram that some uh, sections has been made that is made during the statistical software that is used, the identification screening eligibility and the included studies. And uh, 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 as per the specific criteria, it will be uh, reflected in each steps. Next, extract the data in the master spreadsheet. Uh, now, one should be very much aware and very much familiar using a spreadsheet uh, that may be Excel or some other applications also. And uh, that should be extracted as much data as possible, cross-check for the errors. And this spreadsheet can be a standalone document. Uh, sometimes web plot digitizer is also used. Web plot digitizer is a method where from the images, uh, it's like reverse from the images data can be extracted uh, here in this um, uh, in this master spreadsheet uh, all the data that is uh, uh, quite related to one particular study that has been included and after that we have to do filtering so to prepare the summary table 
and this is the summary table that uh, that has been made and this summary table should finalize the parameters for analysis the parameters that we are going to uh, analyze that has been mentioned earlier into the protocol that should be mentioned here so here we can see that the demographic details, measurement of the exercise capacity, duration of exercise, exercise intensity or types that has been mentioned specifically. Uh, now, um, after systematic review, if we move to meta-analysis, uh, the definition of meta-analysis is the, it's the statistical analysis of a large collection of analysis uh, results from individual studies for the purpose of integrating the findings. Uh, it can be also said that it's a set of techniques used to combine the results of a number of different reports uh, into one report to create a single more precise estimate of an effect. So meta-analysis, the statistical models that is used very commonly, that is a fixed effect. Another one is random effect. These terminologies will come again and again during uh, doing the meta-analysis. This fixed effect concept is that the assumption is that the true effect size is same in all studies. All factors that influence the effect size are the same in all studies and differences are due to chance. Here, the heterogeneity, heterogeneity is actually ignored and that thus this will provide a narrow confidence interval. In random effect, here the assumption is that its true effect can vary across the studies and the heterogeneity is actually incorporated. And as the heterogeneity is incorporated, it will provide a larger confidence interval. There are different softwares like uh, Meta Excel, uh, Access and uh, Meta Excel, uh, all these available, but amongst those, Redman is the most popular software that is used. Uh, in Redman, just a small snapshot we have put here that these studies are here. And after that, this data is been put here. This is the experimental and the control data. This is the weight and this is the uh, mean difference. Uh, after that, we can see is that the fixed effect and the random effect, forest plot, funnel plot, risk of bias, uh, export the figures, uh, and then the output. One thing is very important that even if we put or feed with some wrong data or garbage data, in that case also, we will get an output. So getting an output is not an issue. Definitely, you will get an output, you will get a plot, everything. But the thing is that the input data should be correct and it should be filtered. It should be uh, as much as possible free of bias. So that studies inclusion uh, and removing some studies uh, should be very important if it is not matching with your inclusion and exclusion criteria. You should not compare the study with others. Your study is a standalone study and it is uh, not comparable with others. So uh, your uh, criteria you have to apply properly and after that you will expect a good output. No, uh, like that, the assessment of the risk of bias, that is very important. Uh, that can be done by different tools like Cochrane risk of bias tool uh, uh, or others. Uh, here we can see in this right-sided figure that uh, this particular studies has been mentioned and here the different types of bias that has been mentioned. So uh, it, sometimes it's possible that um, even uh, some studies that included lots of bias. So during that time, we have to do certain uh, specific uh, uh, statistical steps, sometimes sensitivity analysis, and do uh, exclusion of a particular study if it is uh, having lots of bias into it. And that bias may be selection bias, that may be performance bias, that may be detection bias, attrition bias, or reporting bias, that can be of different types. The Cochrane risk of bias tool for the RCTs, uh, here the risk of bias has been categorized as low risk of bias, unclear risk of bias, higher risk of bias, high risk of bias. Actually, these tools are making the systematic review and meta-analysis on the top because we, these things are present in a narrative review, which we cannot exclude. And in this systematic review and meta-analysis, we are applying certain tools to exclude these risk factors. So according to this risk of bias, low, unclear, or high risk, the interpretation of low risk is that plausible bias unlikely to seriously alter the results uh, it's within the study and low risk of bias for all key domains. Uh, similarly, if we go to the opposite one, that is the high risk of bias, here the plausible bias that seriously weakens the uh, confidence in the result and within the study, uh, a high risk of bias for one or more key domains. 
Uh, now, another important thing is the forest plot. Forest plot is a output as we have seen in the uh, software output. A forest plot, there are certain things that is present. Uh, all of us have gone through forest plot. Just as a quick summary, we will go through that this X axis, Y axis, we, we can see this horizontal and the uh, uh, vertical axis. The vertical uh, one is actually said the line of null effect and this horizontal axis, it can be uh, the central point can be one that can be zero depending upon what uh, type of analysis and uh, which we are analyzing. Uh, that could be a relative statistics like odds ratio or relative risk or that can be an absolute one like uh, this ARR, which is stands for absolute risk reduction or sometimes SMD that is standardized uh, mean difference. And this, uh, this uh, if the relative risk like odd ratio or uh, relative risk have a null effect, the value of one, but for absolute statistics like uh, ARR or SMD, the null difference value is zero. And uh, the this vertical line is placed at a value as this title suggests there is no association, that means line of null effect between an exposure and outcome or no difference between the two interventions. Uh, here we can see certain uh, uh, horizontal lines uh, that actually denotes uh, different studies uh, and some black uh, boxes uh, over here. Some boxes are small, some are uh, bigger and these horizontal lines sometimes crossing this vertical or line of null effect. Sometimes it's in one side. So according to that, certain interpretation can be made from this uh, figure. So we will quickly have a look into that, that each horizontal line actually put into a forest plot represents a separate study. And each study result has two components into it. One is the point estimate and another one is this uh, horizontal line. The point estimate is this, the bigger box be the more participants in the study that they reflect. And the horizontal line, they reflect the 95% confidence interval of the study. Sorry with uh, each end of the line representing the boundaries of the confidence interval. Now, what each side of the null effect represent uh, is also very important when looking at the individual studies. Uh, next is that we, this is like a thumb rule. One can say that any study line which crosses the line of null effect does not illustrate a statistically significant result. Uh, uh, now, how actually this forest plot comes with the data, it looks like this. And there is a, another thing that is present that is diamond. This diamond is also present here. And uh, these are the studies made, and this is the summary of all the studies that diamond. This diamond, the corners of diamond actually reflect the confidence interval of that particular diamond or the whole, or, or all the studies. And uh, another very important point that is present here is the heterogeneity or the I squared. That is also and the the F is mentioned over that is the 95% of country interval. So factors that affect the precision, the precision with which the effect size is extended interval the precision primarily driven by sample size and studies that yield more precise estimates of the effect size. Uh, now, uh, describing uh, heterogeneity, that can be for different reasons like clinical heterogeneity, methodological heterogeneity, statistical heterogeneity. Uh, now, for um, uh, analysis of this heterogeneity, and uh, we can have a separate session on that, uh, but just for our understanding, this clinical heterogeneity, that can be due to variability in the population intervention and outcome. Methodological heterogeneity, that can be due to uh, for variability in the study design and statistical heterogeneity, that is for the variability in the interventional effect or sometimes result of clinical or methodological diversity. Now to address the heterogeneity, check again that the data are correct, explore and subgroup analysis, sometimes meta regression, that is another method, perform a random effect uh, meta analysis, uh, exclude sometimes uh, some studies which are outliers, unexplained heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity that discuss the probable reasons. Uh, followed by sensitivity analysis. That is a very uh, important step. Uh, determine whether the assumptions or decisions made have a major effect on the results of the review. In that case, the sensitivity analysis is a repeat of the primary analysis or the meta-analysis. 
substituting the alternative decisions or range of values for decisions that were arbitrary or unclear. Sometimes some data, some studies that is having certain arbitrary com uh, uh, comment or conclusion, or that is unclear, or you are uh, not very much clear about the interpretation they are giving. In that case, even after discussion, communication, if it is not done in that case, uh, that can be excluded and the sensitivity analysis can be done. Uh, again, a subgroup analysis that is sometimes again done that is identifying in, that should be identified in the protocol with justification and it is to enhance the usefulness of the research answers. Publication bias and small study effect, uh, that is another problem that happens in narrative review. Uh, here, uh, different methods are used and one very common plot that is used is the funnel plot. In the funnel plot, we can see this one is the this uh, vertical line that is non dotted another this dotted line and that can be the symmetrical plot in the absence of the bias and this asymmetrical plot in the presence of the publication bias this uh, uh, this uh, funnel plot uh, actually giving this pictorial format but for the interpretation of the statistical part uh, it's required certain types of test uh, application like big majumdar test or eager test uh, this is very much commonly used for this uh, bias and this publication bias actually uh, uh, it deals with these statistically significant results are more likely to be published and cited. This is a common finding and published in English language journals and indexed in the midline. There are different uh, tastes and the basis. Um, we can have a different session into that, skipping this one as of now. So quality of the evidence generated, uh, as we were discussing in the very beginning, that grade. Uh, that is the objective interpretation that is grading of recommendation assessment development and evaluation it says the level of evidence that is generated it does not reflect the quality of the meta analysis uh, next another very important and uh, important is the prisma checklist uh, and we know that this prisma checklist contains a uh, list of things and uh, we know again that the prisma stands for the preferred reporting item for systematic review and meta analysis and it is an evidence based minimum set of items which is required for reporting the systematic review and the uh, meta analysis and it contains a certain checklist item and some uh, flow diagram. So uh, we can have a look into that, that the, the broad headings are like title, abstract, introduction, methods, and under that, the specific things are there. And we have to Now, checklist to assess RCT and uh, SRMA, if we summarize, we can say that are the results of the review valid? Next is the, is it worth continuing? Next is what are the results? And next is, will the results help locally? So all those things uh, should be mentioned uh, for making this checklist. Uh, there are certain uh, development of Amster, uh, which is a measurement tool for to assess the methodological quality of the systematic review. Uh, there are certain recent updates into this again. Now, grading of the evidence uh, that can be made, uh, said that it may be very low, it can be low, it can be moderate, it can be high. And here the factors to consider is the risk of bias, imprecision, inconsistency, indirectness, and publication bias. In very low uh, grading here, the true effect is probably markedly different from the estimated effect. And in the high one, that is the authors have a lot of confidence that the true effect is very much similar to the estimated effect. Uh, uh, another important uh, thing is that the network meta-analysis. Uh, network meta analysis it's a little bit different we will move to a figure in the next slide that here we can see that uh, indirect comparison uh, we want to do with certain difference that means we want to compare a versus b but direct evidence from the trial is present in one two and seven okay and indirect evidence that is present from three four five six and seven so uh, if we want to compare all combining all. So if we combine all, in that case, the randomization will be uh, destroyed. So that's why what is used, that is used is the indirect evidence. That means A versus C and the B versus C. 
that competition is done as additional evidence to preserve the randomization and within study competition. So in that case, uh, we can uh, uh, say this comparison is possible and that is what known as network meta-analysis. That is the, the combine the direct and indirect estimate of multiple treatment effect, internally consistent set of estimates that respects the randomization and calculate the probability that each treatment is most effective compared to the conventional pairwise meta-analysis, greater precision in summary estimates, ranking of treatments according to the effectiveness. Uh, this is the network uh, meta-analysis uh, graphically. If we see here, these different drugs are compared. Now, if uh, here uh, with this already comparison done, now, if we want to do some other comparison, in that case, this method should be followed for network meta-analysis. Here also, we can see this bigger size actually reflects a more sample size, and the thicker this line is uh, actually reflects a more association. Now, if we want to compare other drugs, in that case, that is also possible, but uh, we have to use certain statistical method, and uh, this network meta-analysis uh, is applied here. Individual patient data meta-analysis, that is IPD meta-analysis, that is again a very important uh, point to discuss. We will just highlight the thing that, uh, say for example, if uh, in a meta-analysis, uh, 18 to 65 years aged people are included and um, the data will be incorporated for other age groups. In that case, uh, we are actually summarizing the data from each studies. Now, one study may have uh, variation in the age group. So for uh, having a specific age group or specific ages, in that case, we have to see into the individual results and individual patients and individual age groups. Accordingly, we have to do the meta-analysis. So it involves a central collection, checking and analysis of the updated individual patient data, include all properly randomized trials, published or unpublished, include all patients in an intention to treat analysis. So the advantage of this IPD meta-analysis is that it carry out time to event analysis. It's only practical way to do subgroup analysis, more flexible analysis of outcomes, carry out the detailed data checking, ensure the quality of randomization and follow-up, ensure the appropriateness of analysis and update the follow-up information. The advantage of this uh, IPD meta-analysis again is studies that are in their neurological used and type of patient studies. Yeah. Sorry, I think there is some issue from Shumalada's side. Shumalada, are you there? Hello, Shumalada, can you hear us? Yeah, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Now you're audible. So Sorry, you... I don't know what happened just before the... Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can please go back to the last slide so that you can, if you, is it possible yes. to little bit describe the last slide and you can proceed. Yes. Now so the take home message and the way forward, we can say that place of SRMA in the level of evidence pyramid, we see how to do an interpret and systematic review. That's a, a technical thing. And if we do a systematic review and meta-analysis, only then we can learn. The theoretical part will help in guiding us, but we have to jump into doing the systematic review and meta-analysis. Only then, we, if we finish the study, only then you, we will be able to learn. And generation of high quality evidence, the original research almost, it's a zero cost. And as Dr. Smitha ma'am said, we just need a laptop internet and we will add that we need a dedicated team with that. 
With that, I would like to thank all of you. These references have been used for this presentation. Thank you. Over to the chairperson, sirs, and madam. Thank you, Dr. Somalia, for such an excellent presentation. And uh, we have a couple of questions in the uh, in the chat box. So, uh, you want me so to read it? So, Sudha wants to know. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Please go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Melvin. Yeah, please go ahead, ma'am. Okay. So, uh, Sudha wants to know. How do we get individual patient data, which is unpublished? If the individual patient data is not uh, available, we have to actually ask the authors. We have to ask the authors because it's the, you know, the data is in their hand. Only then it is possible to get the uh, uh, data of these individual patients. Uh, Madam, right. you can so also add we, or sir, you can also add some points if you want, if you also, uh, I mean, uh, additional points. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sumalia. But unfortunately, I uh, personally don't have any experience about this uh, individual patient meta-analysis. I have seen a couple of them um, while as a resident and while uh, my students present them. Uh, technically, uh, if the data is in public domain, most of the times, if they, um, the US FDA like it uh, regulates the data that the um, pharmaceutical generates, so it's uh, after certain time, the data sharing agreement, uh, as per the data sharing agreement, these data are available in the public domain. So if they are, then you possibly don't need to take any permission from anyone. But having said that, if, if there is an important piece of information you uh, really like to uh, uh, conduct a meta-analysis and you think there is a, a, a great evidence that can be generated, you will obviously have to write to the uh, authors or the, um, usually these days, therefore, the, the uh, when they publish, they say the data is in the custody of so-and-so or so-and-so firm or so-and-so investigators. So in that case, you will have to write to them to uh, get the data. Hey, Dr. Melvin, you would like to add anything? Yeah, I, I think uh, you, have, you, have, you have mentioned the key aspect of individual patient data is data which is already available. In the rare instance, when we do not have that, we have an option to uh, write to the authors. And if we get that extra additional data, we could use it for the meta-analysis as well. Now, there's one more question. Uh, what is the, I mean, do we need ethics committee permission for doing a systematic review and meta-analysis? Yeah, I would like to answer that, uh, Somalia. Yeah, <clears throat> if I'm wrong, please correct me. Uh, Professor Tripathi sir is also there. For systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, hopefully there will be no requirement for doing the ethics committee permission, but it's always good to have an ethics committee permission because later on, whenever we will publish it in good journal, the ethics committee approval and other documents that will actually strengthen your document. And it's always good to have comments from your peers and the senior persons who are sitting in ethics committee. Uh, but uh, as per regulatory purpose, uh, this ethics committee approval is um, not required. That's my understanding. Uh, yeah, please. Give yeah, your... uh, I think, uh, I mean, as you rightly put it, uh, I, the ICMR guidelines gives certain uh, studies which can be considered as exemption from review. Under that uh, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, because the data that you're gathering is primarily something that is available already in the public domain. Uh, there is no question of uh, privacy and confidentiality here. And uh, you are you are not gathering any individually identifiable data, so it is uh, it is something that is acceptable. So it will uh, certainly, if you want to do, you could uh, go ahead and get a ethics committee no objection certificate for doing the maintenance. But it is just going to delay the timelines that you probably have for doing this project. In fact, that is rather an advantage. Many people go ahead and do systematic reviews and maintenance because this is one thing which they don't have to wait for a. EC approval, which probably will take, uh, we'll have to wait once in two months for the committee to meet. They come and by the time you get the approval letter, you will you would have waited for two, three months 
So that is one advantage rather uh, of doing a systematic review meta analysis where you just need a laptop, a good internet connection, a bunch of dedicated people to come around to gather the data and uh, intelligently do the risk of bias and uh, forest plot and give your uh, uh, paper based on all these uh, data that is gathered. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with Dr. Melvin actually. But uh, as, as somehow uh, recently I reviewed a paper. Uh, it came to me for review uh, from some journal which I would not disclose, Indian journal. The uh, uh, the set of investigators were from Ames, New Delhi. And somehow I could see a ethics committee approval number. I was wondering myself that if uh, if ethics committee approval is needed, because this was also my understanding that if the data is already in the published form, so there is no confident, uh, confidentiality that is involved. And uh, uh, more so uh, for a, for a non-patient data, which is not the source data, which has already been published, peer reviewed, so to my mind, you also do, you don't need them. And in fact, uh, if you remember, the Prospero that never asks for any kind of approval from your local site. Okay. Thank you, madam. And uh, we'll go to the next question. If few studies have a particular outcome as primary and few others as secondary outcome in a meta-analysis, can these be merged? Dr. Vikash Maharishi has asked this question. Somalia, are you there? Okay, Dr. Smitha, you want to take up that question? Two studies have a particular outcome as primary and others have it as a secondary. In a meta-analysis, can they, they be merged? So yes, they can be merged. And uh, basically, you are looking at the outcome. You are not looking at whether these outcomes are, uh, they are robust enough for, uh, I mean, statistical significance, because uh, most of the time our sample size calculation is based on the primary outcome. And uh, the secondary outcomes are uh, just the outcomes that you are trying to assess, but they do, the statistical robustness for the uh, uh, secondary outcomes cannot be guaranteed. Saying yeah, that uh, the whole idea of a meta-analysis is to pool the outcomes as they are. So you are looking at a larger sample size and you can pool the uh, outcomes, whether they are primary or secondary, if they meet the inclusion criteria. Inclusion criteria thereby, I mean, uh, you have the same set of patients, same kind of comparator, same kind of intervention, and the timeline for assessing those kind those outcomes are similar. So you can. The bottom line is that you can actually pull. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask another question as a uh, as an additional part of this question itself. Now, when you are doing the risk of bias, you are going to obviously find some studies which are high risk of bias and some studies which are low risk of bias. Now, what do you do finally with respect to taking the data for doing the meta-analysis, do you uh, finally take up, okay, you have labeled some studies as high risk and some as low risk. Do you uh, go to the extent of excluding those data which are uh, from papers which are having a high risk of bias and only take data of papers which have a low risk of bias? Or do you take everything finally and do the meta-analysis? Dr. Sumalia, would you like to take Take up this question. I think Dr. Somalia is not there. Uh, he's uh, some. He has some yeah, network yes, issues. You're there. You're there. Okay. Look, actually, yeah, Dr. Somalia, please actually, answer. Yes. Please address that question, Dr. Somalia. You are able to hear me, right? Uh, very nicely asked question, sir. That uh, this bias will be there. Uh, uh, now uh, we have seen this fixed model and the other model. So which model we are actually going to select in the very beginning, we have to select that uh, uh, design, okay. And if we are seeing that uh, data that actually will hamper the overall result, okay. Uh, in that case, we have to do the sensitivity analysis and we have to exclude the study and do the sensitivity analysis. Otherwise the uh, net result will be uh, faulty. 
Okay. Yeah, Dr. Melvin, may I add a line? Yes, please. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. So uh, when we uh, do the risk of bias analysis, most of the times when we see a high risk uh, risk of bias, with uh, they are usually with a smaller uh, study. I mean, usual that that my my thing is usually, but. Um, uh, random effect model you by and large select because you want to uh, have uh, give the benefit of doubt that the data is variable. Now, uh, when you see a study with a very significant uh, risk of you actually do a sensitivity analysis and see after excluding that study if your results are in the same direction or if it's, it is going the other way. That would mean that uh, the study with significant risk of bias is driving the uh, the effect size and its direction. So you basically do a sensitivity analysis, whether it is for a single study or a couple of study, it's your choice. Yes, thank you, ma'am. So it's basically we try to gauge how much difference that those high risk of bias studies are contributing to the final effect size okay. and uh, make those disclaimers very clearly when you are writing your discussion. Uh, great answer, ma'am. And so all the one... reasoning has to be kept, all the reasoning has to be kept that why we are doing, why yes. we are including in between steps. So that is also very important later on. And thank you, Dr. Somalia. One more question. To perform systematic review, Articles from at least how many databases should we include? Is there any criteria for it? Is it as many databases or libraries which require paid subscription? Yeah, this is a question. I, it is uh, asked by Dr. Anshuman. Yeah. Yeah, this uh, uh, we were discussing in the beginning of presentation that we have to do as many as databases available on that particular topic. And almost all the data uh, should be uh, tried to get because it's sometimes not possible to get all the data. Sometimes the authors do not respond, uh, but we have to try our best to include all the databases and as well as to include the conference proceedings also, as well as to proceed for the gray literatures also. Yes, I think this is always a challenge. Uh, many times when we are in India, we may not have access to certain articles. It's it's a good it's a good uh, habit to write to the authors. And now there is some uh, thing called Research Gate. Sometimes you will be able to contact the authors directly through Research Gate. And many times they are very forthcoming. They bring out. Uh, I mean, they they will uh, send you there. And if you're going to tell them that you're doing a meta analysis, you you are going to cite them. All the more they'll be happy to share that data with you. And uh, there's uh, any other question, Dr. Smitha, we have missed? Yeah, there's one question from Ranjit who wants to know what's the difference between systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, Dr. Somalia, would you like to address this? Yeah, this is the, uh, without uh, uh, statistical part, if we are doing, in that case, that is known as systematic review. And uh, when we apply the statistics, we include all the data. That means quanti quantitative part is the systematic review and the qualitative part that is actually the meta-analysis. Yeah, and very often we'll have uh, a situation where we'll be starting with a systematic review and trying to do a meta-analysis, but then as we review the literature and uh, study the endpoints that have assessed, we'll realize that the data are so heterogeneous that it is almost impossible to uh, go ahead and do a meta-analysis. So we might end up just writing a systematic review and uh, summarizing the results, and we're not being able to uh, come out with an effect size, pooled effect size, or anything of that kind. So a lot of times we'll find only systematic reviews without meta-analysis that is equally valid as well. In fact, one of the greatest challenges personally I find when doing systematic reviews meta-analysis is that uh, data are very, very heterogeneous. Very often when we uh, do the meta-analysis, the uh, we find that the papers, the way they have even expressed the data are so different, so diverse. So it is almost impossible to, and then you'll have a lot of studies which will get automatically excluded 
because of some XYZ reason. And then what you are left is just one or two studies uh, for a particular outcome. And for that one or for the two studies, you will have to plot a forest plot. It would look really, uh, I mean, it doesn't look so nice to just have two studies and plot a forest plot with it. And finally, your conclusion will be, we will just need more studies. We don't have enough evidence, uh, which is very often the conclusion in a lot of meta-analysis. Uh, so uh, identifying a smart question is very important, but at the same time, identifying a question for which you really have enough evidence to really make some uh, systematic review and meta analysis. There are many questions you can ask. The question will be very good, but then you might not have sufficient studies to bring out an answer. So if you know that well in advance, then you might have to rethink whether you really need to do a systematic review meta analysis at that point. Your comments? Yeah, I kind of huh? yeah, agree with you, Dr. Melvin, because many of the uh, systematic review actually end up saying that uh, uh, we need a larger clinical trial to address this question. And more often than not, this is the conclusion uh, of oftentimes we see that, okay, there is a large clinical trial that needs to be conducted. Okay. Let me... Okay, scoping reviews assess the extent of the available evidence, but systematic reviews more targeted. A comment from Dr. Shanoi. Uh, okay, if one more question. If we do not have access to all databases and refer to just one or two databases, will the study be invalid? Dr. Sumalia, you want to answer that question? Uh, sir, can you repeat the question once? Like, uh, what are the minimum number of databases needed to do a systematic review. Will it be considered invalid if you have only one database or two databases? Uh, no, it's not that uh, invalid, but the point is that uh, for the validity of the result and the if one, uh, someone repeat the study uh, in a sim similar way, there should be a similar result. And that's why multiple databases are required. If there is no study in these multiple databases, in that case, only one uh, database can be used. I'll just give one example of ours that um, during our uh, post-graduation, we have done a very small meta-analysis. And during that time, only three studies was there present. And after that, we, we have collected the data and collected the data. And uh, uh, it was the industry-sponsored uh, randomized clinical trial. It was a very tricky thing, but we have sent an email. We have just communicated an email, but we have not got any response from them. Uh, we progressed and further, and after that, we published the literature. During that time, we got a call from that particular industry that uh, because it was not saying a good to their drug. So we got a call from there that we will take legal action against you because you have not included the data that we are having. Uh, otherwise, the result might have been changed. So uh, that is the thing. I This is just an example I'm telling that if we do not have the data, we, we should try. But even after try, if we don't have, in that case, uh, we have to uh, put that uh, one as a result, but there should be that as a limitation. That limitation we have to main main, uh, mention in the, into the discussion part, that these are the discussion uh, because the data might be changed and the conclusion also might be changed. Thank, thank you, Dr. Smalia. The, uh, uh, a question that is very much connected to this question is, what are the minimum number of studies required to do a systematic review meta-analysis? So uh, actually, two studies are required. Two studies are required to conduct a, a, a meta-analysis. Uh, but uh, for doing these studies, these two studies, again, should be uh, very much similar. Uh, otherwise, um, during this, if we uh, do not apply this inclusion exclusion criteria properly, in that case, one study might be out. In that case, we will not be able to conduct the study. So with very minimum number of studies, uh, that we face during uh, doing, uh, it's very difficult. The number may be two, but again, with two numbers uh, doing a meta-analysis is very difficult because if we apply our inclusion-exclusion criteria, 
one study there is high chance that might be excluded then what to do then uh, one cannot do uh, Smita ma'am uh, uh, any comment yeah, of yours I I have a little different opinion Dr. Sumal in the sense that sometimes you have only those studies available you can conduct a meta-analysis it depends on the number of patients or the subjects that study includes so if if let's say we are here for this uh, discussion uh, shake or uh, we are just saying that uh, we are doing systematic reviews for interventional studies. when there are large observational studies we do systematic reviews for observational studies also so because the forest plot computing a forest plot is most of the times is synonymous with inter intervention studies. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a systematic review, if even if you have two studies and uh, you're doing a study, a study of the, the observational studies, you may still uh, be coming with some effect size, but uh, yeah, the, the result, the robustness of the result of the systematic review will depend mostly on the number uh, individuals and that you are comparing. Does that, uh, I mean, does it sound okay, yes, Dr. Somalia? Completely agree. Yes, completely agree, ma'am. Completely agree with that. Okay. So we'll, we'll there's learn. another question by Sudha. Dr. Melvin, would you like to take yes. up that? Yeah. For so hypothetically, for the study you did with three studies, after 10 years now, can I do the same study as there would be more data now? Is it permitted? So essentially the question is, uh, can you redo the meta-analysis if a previous meta-analysis was done 10 years back and now you have some additional two or three more studies, can we uh, redo the same meta-analysis? Yes, we can. And actually this will add value and we can see this one in literatures uh, nowadays. Uh, especially in diabetic patients, we, we are seeing lots of changes in the treatment plan because of the recent studies and recent meta-analysis with this current data and this robustness of the data that are actually changing the treatment planning also sometimes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Samalia. Uh, uh, may I add a line, please? Yes, ma'am. So uh, there's a caveat to this, Sudha, because uh, let's say our clinical practices change our treatment standards change. So when you uh, are pooling studies which are over 10 years, 20 years, you have to keep that in mind uh, while you are interpreting the results. So, and, and, and that part should figure out in the, in the discussion part when you are interpreting the effect size or the results of your meta-analysis. So the final question, in the interest of time, we'll just have one more question, and that is uh, whether observational study and RCT data, could we pool them together while doing a systematic review and meta-analysis? This is a million dollar question. I have seen a comment of Smita Madam published article onto that. Am I correct, ma'am? <laughs> this is a million dollar question. <laughs> Yes, Dr. Somalia, please go ahead. Yes, ma'am, I, I want to listen the answer from you because I have read the answer from a publication of yours onto the same thing. As a comment, you have given a publication. So we'll be very glad to listen the answer from you, ma'am. Actually, actually, technically... As a summary, I would say that no. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, ma'am. From technical perspective... I mean, from because all of you are clinical pharmacologists, I can say this, that if you are technically sound, you know what an observational study is and what an RCT is, then you would not combine because uh, uh, most of the times they don't conquer the same thing. And uh, of course, of course, there are uh, something like you take the effect size of insulin or uh, um, any other uh, antibiotic or anything that would be similar but from a technical perspective no but uh, people do combine and uh, you may do whatever but you may have to justify the the findings so 
if you give me an opportunity i would have i would have computed the rct effect size separately and the observational studies separately but you it would not be a rare finding if you see meta analysis uh, which are kind of pooling both rcts and observational studies Uh, Dr. Smita, I this is Dr. Bhomik just said, and I completely yeah. agree with you because we have done few meta analysis on the evolving literature for COVID nineteen therapeutics, and especially when it was with doxycycline and ivermectin. Let me tell you that we had to pull in observational data, and there were very less randomized control trials, so that was a perfect example where both the data sets were used. And you are absolutely correct. that effect size was calculated separately for both the study designs so i completely concur with your idea that yes we can pool both the data uh, both kinds of literature but effect size needs to be calculated separately thank you so much dr subrajyoti for adding your valuable comments to this question and again at this time we would like to thank uh, the speaker dr sumaya sen for Uh, giving this talk on its systematic reviews and meta analysis and, and special thanks to dr smita dr subrajyoti for giving their valuable inputs for this session and also to dr shambho for organizing this program and uh, helping us all to learn together so over to you dr shambho thank you very much sir so uh, it is a overwhelming session we must appreciate that and we are really thankful to dr shumal roshan for this wonderful deliberation and we are really glad and we are really thankful to both of our respective chairpersons professor smita patnayak and professor melvin george because of you uh, two also this session becomes very much interactive and we we learn a lot from you two also so thank you once again so on behalf of indian pharmacological society west bengal chapter i i am really uh, grateful to our chairpersons our uh, speaker for giving us their valuable time we are really thankful to professor medhi sir also for giving his valuable time hello doctor yeah hello yeah thank you dr sambhu actually i was busy with and so so definitely next time i'll participate thank you thank you very much Thank, thank you, you sir thank you very thank much you, for thank you thank you folks okay and uh, also we are, we are really thankful to dr bhomik for uh, giving his valuable time so uh, with that as we are uh, almost one and half hour we are sir, here so we have the form yeah. there is some issue i think so uh, like when they click the feedback form it goes to some study questionnaire so maybe oh. if you want Yeah, okay, we will we'll talk with that yeah. later. Fine. So again, uh, I am thankful to our chairpersons. So SCPI, as uh, may I request Melvin George sir, so please introduce our new society that SCPI to all of this our participants. Yeah. So SCPI is an organization that is uh, uh, looking at building clinical pharmacology. Uh, we all know how clinical pharmacology can contribute in building this nation in terms of research in terms of academics in terms of bioethics uh, and uh, patient care so in the days ahead we look forward to uh, doing many programs uh, along with our respected uh, uh, scientists clinical pharmacologists uh, across the country and uh, thereby we could definitely help our young budding uh, pharmacologists across the country to learn uh, the best they can in this interesting domain of clinical pharmacology so thank you dr shambhu thank you sir thank you thank once you once. everyone dr shambhu there is a request from one of the participants i think about a workshop i think you should next next venture should be your workshop yes yes madam and we are really hopeful that we will get you as our faculty because you you are one of the pioneer in this particular field and we all always remember your presence at our uh, school of tropical medicine workshop on systematic I, I, i am really honored with that uh, compliment but yes i i will try my best yes thank you thank so you. much thank you for inviting me
Yeah, oh, okay. Dr. Kambu, uh, like I said in the beginning, that we'll be having a, another training program, uh, a physical mode. So preferably in the university. Uh, so we can also highlight that. So maybe in the next month. Yeah. 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 Okay, okay. Wonderful. Okay. Wonderful initiative, sir. One of the participants really uh, wanted that. So yeah. please share that and do send yeah. a link to me, sir, if I can extend that link to other people also. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Thank you, so much, Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So again, so every good thing needs to have some end, happy ending. So we are really uh, waiting for this physical meeting on a detailed workshop on systematic review and meta-analysis. We, on behalf of Indian Pharmacological Society West Bengal chapter, really want to be a participants in that particular program too. So thank you all the respected faculties today present and all the delegates who were there with us. So goodbye and bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.